Opinionated is proudly supported by Stage and Studio Productions, Gateway Printing, William Jeffries Carpet Warehouse and Perth Prop and Party Shop. Welcome back to Opinionated. In the first segment we heard from the two Davids, David Cake and David Thomas, and their expertise shown on what BRICS is actually all about. They were quite positive. In the second segment we'll be hearing from two more guests. and We might be hearing a different view of BRICS. Uh, our guests will be Alex Bainbridge from the Socialist Alliance. He was a co-founder. And uh, Craig Isherwood from the Citizens Electoral Council. And he's the editor of The New Citizen. Um, but before we go to our guests, Let's go to a video clip on BRICS once again about the potential growth of BRICS 2020, 2050, 2100. The world's giant emerging economies are gathering in South Africa, looking to reshape their BRICS organization. Uh, leaders of Brazil, Russia, China, India, and of course the host nation are all at the summit. With Egypt's President Morsi, he's set to attend. He's uh, hoping to join the bloc in the not too distant future. Uh, reporting now, RT's Alexei Rashevsky, uh, reporting ultimately on the expectations for strengthening the group. Since its inception in 2009, many have been wondering what BRICS is all about, a symbol of growing global multipolarity or a counterweight to the EU and NATO. The leaders of the member states have been cautiously downplaying its role, saying this alliance is purely economic and exists mostly on verbal agreements. Officially, it's not even a legally bound international organization. The BRICS leaders are only now contemplating setting up headquarters in one of the capitals. But just look at every BRICS country separately. Russia, the world's largest largest minerals exporter, China, the world's second largest economy and the source of a cheap labor force, India, cheap intellectual resources, Brazil with its enormously powerful agricultural sector and the Republic of South Africa, the continent's leader in natural resources. Put the country's economic stats together, the numbers are nothing short of impressive. Last year, the BRICS countries averaged a 4% GDP growth, whilst the G7 countries came up with only 0.7% and their collective gross national product already exceeds 27% of the global output. And this economic might of the Group of Five could diversify into a joint BRICS development bank. This idea appeared during last year's summit in New Delhi, and there are certain indications this year's meeting in Durban could pave way to its creation. Should this prove to be the case, the world may see a new powerful financial institution. We are now on the verge of a formal decision. Uh, it would be a substantial, in terms of capital and paid capital, a substantial new international institution. This development bank uh, is probably one of the major deliverables. Having BRICS uh, more and more prominent in the area of economy, international finance, the development of infrastructure. The common standpoint among the BRICS states on major international issues could also be a huge factor in global geopolitics. The war in Syria is just one of the examples. The Group of Five has been insisting on a peaceful solution to the conflict and with Moscow and Beijing firmly standing within the UN Security Council against any military intervention. No wonder experts say Bashar Assad recently asked the Group of Five to help bring the conflict to an end. Many experts believe that despite BRICS being an informal group, its geopolitical weight is already very high. As for political role of BRICS, uh, it's quite huge. Uh, actually, now the major international institutions which present uh, the whole humankind in uh, solving uh, economic problems, for example, is, is G20. Uh, I, I think at this point, uh, the decisions of G20 are predetermined by the position of BRICS. So BRICS has yet to become an officially established organization, but the Russian president already said cooperation within this bloc will be Moscow's top foreign priority this year. And considering that at least five countries, including Mexico, Indonesia and Egypt, are willing to join, the world may soon see a powerful alliance of developing economies, which experts say, even in its current configuration, may become the world's wealthiest union of states in 30 years. Once again, welcome back to Opinionated, and we'll uh, go straight to our in-studio guest, Alex Bainbridge, co-founder of the Socialist Alliance. Alex, we heard a lot uh, in that little uh, video clip, 
and uh, much was said about cheap labour. So when it comes to the division of rich and poor, what do you have to say? Look, I think if you want to really understand anything in international politics, whether it's the big wars, whether it's the like trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, any kind of international developments, you really need to look at the fact the world is divided into very rich countries and very poor countries. And obviously in Australia, we're you know, a, junior, a junior power in, among those rich countries. And I think that um, you know, from our point of view, from the point of view of ordinary people in Australia... Uh, I'll I just ask one question and we'll keep on track with what you're saying. Uh, what defines a rich country? Because to some people, China's a rich country, but when we look at the ordinary population, can we truly define China as a potentially rich country? Look, I think that uh, when, when, I'm when I'm talking about a rich country, what I'm talking about are the, the, the countries with the, with the capital and the power, the military power and the economic power to basically push their might around the world. Now, China is... I mean, you, no one can deny that China's had a big rise in, in recent uh, decades, but it, you wouldn't say it is part of the, the traditional groupings of the, the big countries like the United States, the European powers, Japan. Um, you know, those sort of countries are the, are the traditional powers in the world. The interesting thing about BRICS is it is... An alternative. It is, a, it is a, uh, a, an alternative power grouping, economic grouping that's coming from outside of those traditional powers. That's what is interesting about it. That's why people are but talking about it. Is that all it, it is? Uh, uh, an alternative power grouping? Is it an alternative medium? Well, I think that's actually the, the very pertinent question, Jerry, because I think that the, the reality is BRICS isn't really a change in the paradigm of what is, you know, what we're normally seeing in the kind of, you know, in the traditional. Uh, in, in the in the in the traditional sort of society, it's not it's not a change. It's basically just different people or in different countries wanting to get into the club. So my big question is: Is it going to deliver any benefit to the ordinary person? Well, that I, is I, being denied at this point in time. I don't think you can give a simple yes/no answer to that question. Because, but because I think you need to look at it from the point of view. I think I think we need to look at it from the point of view of the interests of ordinary people, and that means you know justice in international relations. Um, and and I don't think that I think you know I don't I don't I don't personally have a lot of confidence that there is a big change coming from those BRICS powers. You look at some of those governments are very authoritarian, um, you know, lots of human rights what, what, problems. What's an alternative to BRICS? Uh, we've mentioned ALBA before, but what's an alternative to BRICS? Well, I think that, I think that ALBA is a much better example of a, of, a, of a new paradigm, a new way of actually building an international for viewers, relationship. For viewers, now, can you tell us a little bit about ALBA? None of your viewers should be um, shocked or worried if you haven't heard of ALBA. Uh, it stands for the Bolivarian Alliance of the Peoples of Our Americas. It's an economic and political grouping of some of the left-wing governments in Latin America. So it was initially founded by Cuba and Venezuela, but I think now involves 11 countries, other countries like Ecuador, uh, Nicaragua, um, uh, Grenada. Does it involve Brazil? That doesn't involve Brazil, no. Although, of course, you know, it does have an influence in you know, Latin American politics, and I think it does have an influence over... Um, you know, other countries that can you like see Brazil. Alba spreading out of the Latin Americas? I uh, look. I think that uh, let's go back to what Alba has done. The interesting thing about Alba, what is interesting about it is that it, it is a new way of actually developing a uh, you know trade on the basis of a social justice um, model. So, for example, um, you know a lot of the early trade or early arrangements in Alba were things like Cuba would provide medical care. Venezuela would provide oil wealth um, to Cuba. So it was a mutually beneficial, uh, both countries, you know, um, basing on their strengths um, and with a, with a very pro-people aspects to it. So one of the, one of the programs that was uh, implemented in this way, uh, Mission Miracle, was about restoring eyesight for poor people all throughout the whole yeah. continent. And they used, you know, uh, Venezuelan oil money to fly the poor people into Cuba whether you use the expert health care... But can you actually... see the rest of the world going down this path? Obviously, you and myself would love to see that, but can Look, you see that as a, a, a viable proposition? Not, not, in a, not in a sort of an immediate, you know, next, next day sort of next, or next year sort of you know, immediate sort of time frame, but I think that there are big problems in the world and I don't think we can keep on going down the same track that we're going. I think it is inevitable that we're going to need... You, know, you look at global warming, you look at the financial crisis, you look at, I mean, the prospects for recession in Australia, you look at, you know, the, the, the economic and political, the social justice issues, we do need to have okay, a change. Let me ask you a question I think, about... And I think, yes, there are a lot of... You know, I don't think you can... I don't think, I don't think it's going to be a simple sort of, you know, automatic growth of ALBA, but I think that you look at you know, Jeremy Corbyn becoming elected leader in um, the Labor Party in Britain, strong support for Bernie Sanders in, uh, in the United States, uh, the recent election of the Syriza government, which has all its complications involved. 
But they what all you have see their complications is they've all got their complications. I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them necessarily. The other, yeah. But but what they all are a reflection of is that there is a growing mood for change, and I think that that is a positive. But it thing. isn't change. Every time there's a, the American Spring, we've had the Arab Spring, and many have argued that that in part was orchestrated, where it uh, suited purpose by uh, the imperialist powers. Uh, the American Spring was actually crushed. Eight thousand uh, occupiers were arrested in the one year. Seven hundred on the Brooklyn Bridge. So when it gets too much of a threat aren't the imperialist powers that you may argue exist or whatever, right, um, going to, you know, come back? Well, I don't think, Jerry, that you can just say that there's no hope for change. I think you look over the last number of decades, uh, all of the good things that we have in our society are the result of popular struggles. Um, you look at the trade union struggles that, you know, won decent living standards, weekends, public holidays, um, you know, uh, health care. You look at the sort of the, can, the political... Can BRICS not deliver some of that? Because some of the union struggle is somehow comparative to what BRICS is actually trying to achieve. Well, I come back to the political character of the governments involved. China, Russia, very authoritarian governments. They're not governments that have got a record about looking after the interests of the people, which is different to the political character of, you know, which, again, the imperfections in, in, in the ALBA countries as well, but uh, you know, a much more consistency in, in being concerned about issues of social justice and the interests of the people. Let me ask you one people. final question. Should Australia join BRICS? Is there a benefit for Australia to join BRICS? No, I wouldn't advocate Australia join BRICS. What I would advocate is that Australia should adopt a policy of social justice and global justice in its, in its foreign policy and international relations. At the moment, we've got a you know, foreign policy which is based totally on the interests of the big corporations which is not in the interests of neither the ordinary people in Australia nor the ordinary people around the rest of the world. On that note, Alex, thank you for your insights and for fueling the light. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Good to be here, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, we'll go now to Craig Isherwood, editor of The New Citizen. And Craig, uh, you've seen uh, the program tonight. What are your views on BRICS? Well, thanks, Jerry, for having me on. The, um, the the issue for the BRICS is it represents a new paradigm in the world, and it's come about because of what's taking place in the West in particular. Um, I'd like to correct one of the earlier speakers, David Thomas, because I know uh, that this idea has been around since the late 90s and specifically came about because of the destruction that was brought by the West after the collapse of the, the, the uh, Russian system, the Soviet system, uh, in the late 80s. And what you had is a massive genocide operation run on Russia for, for a decade, the West went in there and looted the place blind. You had the rise of the new oligarchs, as they call. State industries were stripped. And people were literally dying, and a, a million people a year were dying, so they had a ne negative population growth. It wasn't until the late 90s that Yevgeny Primakov, the Prime Minister, um, and initially as Russian Foreign Minister, came in with a new idea, which was to create, instead of focusing on the West, but to create a new multipolar world. And he had a grand design, which was uh, focused on a grand alliance between Moscow, Beijing, and New Delhi. Now, that's what he actually talked about in the late yes. 90s. And in his, in, his, um, in his memoirs in 2011, he only just died, actually, uh, in June this year. In his memoirs, he actually referred to the BRICS as a realisation of this, um, this concept that he'd uh, come up with back in, in the, late, uh, the late 90s. Now, the focus of the BRICS is completely different to what the focus is in the West. Um, it's got a very strong focus on the idea of national sovereignty first and foremost. Whereas what, what in the West, do you, you see what, what, do you mean, what do you mean by that? It's got a, uh, an onus on national sovereignty. Well, the fact is, look, look at the West at the moment, Jerry, and you find that you've got all these wars with Afghanistan, Libya, uh, particular Iraq, you know, wars, genocidal wars, which has led to the rise of ISIS and what's taking place in Syria and Iraq right now. This is a global disaster built upon the idea initiated by Tony Blair of this responsibility... So, you, uh, Craig, government. you're basically saying that wars have been crafted? They have, because the principle of the Treaty of Westphalia, the idea of protecting and developing sovereign nation-states, has been overtaken by this idea that you have supranational organisations that can intervene and to destroy the sovereignty of nations. But uh, forgetting the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, if wars are crafted, that's been a narrative um, uh, thousands of years, but if wars are crafted, they're usually for the accumulation of resources. Would that be a fair uh, statement? Yeah, to a limited number of nations, and what you've seen in the, in the past, uh, that's what's actually taken place. The issue with the BRICS, though, has been a response to what's taken place uh, since the destruction of Russia it's been instigated very heavily by Russia because they see the need for a multipolar world. And with the destruction of the Soviet Union, 
uh, you've had you had a single superpower, and they were being crushed by that. So they reached out to other countries, and of course, what you have today is the BRICS. And this this question of sovereignty is very very important for Russia, to China, and for all the other countries, India, South Africa. And I might add, if you go back to the beginning of the 19th century, Jerry, you look at this the the components of the British Empire in the form of how it controlled the world. It was the largest single empire at that time with enormous capability. And each of these countries has had some degree or an experience of this oligarchical empire type system. So, but there's other issues here, Derek, because um, it's not just, there's this question of sovereignty has a real, has a real meaning for these countries. I mean, uh, I was able to attend the Civic BRICS Forum in, uh, in Moscow in July at the invitation of the um, Professor Georgi Tolareya, who's the national executive of the Russian National Committee on BRICS Research. And he wanted us there because of our organisations fight for this, these principles uh, over a long period of time, about 25 years. At that particular conference, I was a, what was really a, a, an eye-opener for me, Jerry, was the fact that money is being used as a weapon. And all... Well, on that, note, on, on that note, Craig, I, I agree with you that money is actually used as a weapon, a tool. Uh, we'll have to leave it there and have you back on again. Thank you, Craig. Okay, uh, just before we go to a commercial break, Alex, what's your views on what Craig just said? Well, I think there's a, a lot of talk about um, sovereignty, but I think the real issue for, for most people is actually is not the sovereignty of nations, but the sovereignty of people. And what we've got is a lot of governments in Australia, for example, and other, and other countries around the world, uh, the governments are looking after the interests of the big corporations, and what we really need is governments that look after the interests of the people. And that's the, that's the kind of change that I'll be looking towards, mate, you know, looking towards. Okay, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Alex. And we'll go to a commercial break and be back with a couple more guests. Opinionated is proudly supported by Stage and Studio Productions, Gateway Printing, William Jeffries Carpet Warehouse and Perth Prop and Party Shop.